Good morning, church. I am so glad to be with you this morning, and uh, I am hoping soon I will get to be with you in person. My goal is um, kind of depending on our COVID numbers and the weather and stuff that we might be able to gather together again in person the first week in May and that we can do that outside so it can be a little safer even if the numbers are a little bit higher than they need to be. Um, but I am so glad that you are worshiping with us in person and I invite you to gather around whatever screen you are watching and greet your neighbors through the comments section um, where you are watching. And I invite you to remind yourself and those who are watching with you that God loves you and there is nothing you can do about it. That you are an incredible miracle of God that is unrepeatable and God is crazy about you. So this morning we have some information and some opportunities for ministry that I want to share with you. Um, the first is, uh, fortunately, in our congregations, we have not had anyone die by COVID, but I do know that there are a number of you who know people who have, and I um, wanted to share some information that I got from FEMA this week. Uh, they are trying to get the news out that there is funeral assistance for people who died by COVID or who died with COVID. Um, I have the information about that. I'm sure you can go look on FEMA's website about that. So if you know people who have lost loved ones to COVID-19, um, there is assistance for paying uh, for funeral expenses. Also, um, your order forms for our Pentecost butterflies that are gonna be coming uh, should have been in on Monday, but if you are somebody who forgot about it or didn't, um, didn't get your form in, if you get those into me today, Sunday, I can still squeak you in because the order is going out to the company uh, today. But if you are somebody who, who didn't get that in but would still like to do that, let me know. Um, also, we had our informational meeting about the preschool at Alden um, and about renewing. I guess uh, at the time last year, there was a thought to uh, kind of have a probationary period as Elena took over as the new director of the preschool to just see how things would go and things have gone well. And we talked about that uh, last week at our informational meeting. And so now, um, by next Sunday, we are voting on renewing uh, the preschool and uh, just uh, supporting our covenant with the preschool. That is a ministry of our church. It is an uh, important part of how we interact with the community. Um, and so I have ballots for that to vote. I had to think a little bit on how we were going to do that since uh, we aren't meeting together for worship, and so uh, having another meeting for the ballot probably wouldn't be very practical. I have ballots for that at the church, um, and you can pick them up from me, or uh, Elena has copies of the ballots, and we're only giving them out, um, we're not just setting them out where people can grab them, we're giving them out to make sure that they go to church members and regular attenders of the church to uh, be a part of that vote. Um, and then if you would like, you can place your vote. There is a box with a slot, a locked box on the office, the church office door. You can just set those in there and they're all going to go in there and we will count them next Sunday. Um, or if you aren't so worried about your vote being anonymous, you can email your vote to the church website, which is aldencommunityumc at gmail.com. Um, and if you are somebody maybe that can't get out of your house or isn't going out of your house and you would like a ballot, just give me a call and let me know and I will get one to you this week. Um, but all those are due by next Sunday. Um, I believe that is all of our opportunities for ministry. Um, and so this week for our call to worship, I have something a little different. It's a poem 
By Kate Bowler, since we can't do so much our call and response for the call to worship, I thought, I read it this week and I thought it was kind of wonderful, so I wanted to share it with you. It is called A Blessing When It Is Better But Not Over by Kate Bowler. God, I am so ready for this pandemic to be over, but it isn't yet. This is a new hard place to be, so full of promise, but undefined risk. Oh God, give me patience, give me hope. Did I mention give me patience? Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. God have mercy, Christ have mercy, spirit have mercy. I, wisdom, have made prudence my dwelling, and find out knowledge and discretion. God have mercy, Christ have mercy, Spirit have mercy. Blessed are we who see the vaccines coming and feel the hope rising, who feel the pull toward the freedoms we crave to hold our loved ones, to gather and sing and worship and play, to walk among people without Year. <clears throat> and so as we gather together, we gather as God's people in this time, in this space, in all the places that we are worshiping together, and we lift up prayers for our community. Our first prayer is for Tina Phillips, who is a friend of Charlene. Uh, she had cancer surgery and is battling cancer this week, and so we pray healing prayers for her as she recovers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We also lift up prayers for the Weatherwax family who are grieving a number of losses in your, their family, and so we pray God's comfort for them in their grief. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We also lift up prayers for B. Berry, who had a bad fall on Monday, and so we pray God's healing for her and comfort as she heals. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. So let us lift up to God all those prayers that we hold deep in our heart and sometimes are afraid to speak out loud. Let us pray to God. Loving and holy God, we come to you this morning with these prayers, prayers of healing, prayers of hope, prayers of grief for people who have lost loved ones. And God, we pray your traveling mercies for all those who are out traveling and visiting, who have found ways to safely travel and experience the beauty of your creation. God, we pray for those of us who are just tired, tired of being home, tired of doing all the things we need to be, to be, to do to be safe, just tired of having to slog through all the things that burden us, God. And so we take those burdens, we take that impatience, we take that struggle and we offer it up to you, God, because you know the way the world is supposed to be, the way that you created this world, and you know all the ways that it is broken, that we have fallen short of your glory, that people are not as well as they should be, people who are not doing all they should be, people who are doing their will and forgetting about your will, God. And so we pray that we might be your people on the, in the world. We might be the ones who offer hope, who offer joy, who offer grace to those who are struggling, who offer mercy, and those who work for justice, God. We pray all these things as we give thanks for all the blessings that you have given us. And even as we 
take those blessings sometimes for granted, but when we are following in your steps, we take those blessings and we share them and we offer them up to you as our offering. And we use those offerings to do your work in the world through your church. We ask that you would bless those offerings and bless our work in the world to make this world more like your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, well, let's sing together again. This time we are um, singing songs and hymns written by Charles Wesley, who's one of my favorite hymn writers, starting with Love Divine, All Loves Excel. This sermon series and these sermons I have kind of based on a lot of his work. Uh, he has done a lot of good work uh, with the Lord's Prayer, and uh, I really appreciated it. And so I wanted to share 
some of that with you, kind of with my own bent on it. Um, and so I wanted to give him credit for that. Now, um, I don't know if you heard about this, but there were two candidates and, you know, as political candidates do, they were fighting it out on the campaign trail. And uh, the one candidate said, you know, I don't even know, you don't, you don't even care about your faith. I bet you don't even go to church. You don't care about things being right and just and good in the world. And the other candidate said, well, yes, I do. I've gone to church all the time and, and I say my prayers every day and I pray that that God would be at work in the world. He's, and uh, the first guy said, I bet you don't even know the Lord's Prayer. And the second guy said, yes, I do. I've, I've said it every day since I was a little child. I know it really well. And the first guy said, well, I'll bet you $20. You can't say it right now. And the guy's like, well, I'll take that bet. And so he sat there and he folded his hands and he bowed his head and he said, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. May angels wake me with the light and keep me through the evening light. Ew, man. Oh, I messed it up. But so the other politicians like, wow, I didn't think you could do that. And he pulled out his wallet and he gave him 20 bucks. Right? They didn't even know what the Lord's prayer was. And many of us, we know the Lord's Prayer, right? We've known it since we were children, and we pray it at least every week when we join together in worship, but maybe you pray it every day. Um, but I think a lot of us don't actually know the Lord's Prayer. We don't know really what these words are that we say. We kind of, we say them, we rattle them off. Um, and Jesus taught us this prayer as a pattern for prayer. And this week, we are going to be talking about the second line of the prayer, the second petition that's in it. And if you want, you can say it along with me. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's how it is in the uh, New Revised Standard that I read for the scriptures. But most of us probably know it better as thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so, um, for this, these lines, it's kind of a three-point sermon pretty easily, but Father Daniel Harrington, he says that this one phrase, these, these three uh, phrases, this one sentence, that it is the central concern of the entire Lord's Prayer. And I guess I'm going to expand on that a little bit and say not only is it the central concern of the Lord's Prayer, I would say it is the central concern and the focus of Jesus's life and mission and ministry in the world. All the stories in the Bible um, of what Jesus is doing with his life, what Jesus is saying with his life, his death, his resurrection, all of that is summarized, all of Jesus' ministry is summarized in this one line of the Lord's Prayer. Um, and so that is what we're going to be talking about today. And last week, um, we learned about thy kingdom come, right? When we talk about thy, that, that word in the prayer, it's this old English word. It means your kingdom, like the New Revised Standard Version translated it and that when we're talking about thy kingdom it stands in contrast to me and my kingdom and so thy is a reminder to us that it's not all about us right um and so when we were little kids from the very beginning or if you have kids or grandkids or nieces and nephews or or um your friends have kids Although I think we might remember it from when we were kids. Little kids, when there is a toy that they want, that they like, and another kid is going to grab it, they grab that toy and hold it close to them. And what do they say? Mine. It's mine. It's my toy. Right? You guys know that? We've all heard it 
We've heard kids say it, and heck, we've seen grown-ups say it too, right? Or even countries say it, this is mine, all mine. And so when we say, thy will be done, thy kingdom come, it is a way of forming our own hearts. We're not telling God it's thy king, it's your kingdom. We are forming our hearts that it's not about us. It's not about my wishes, my will, how I want the world to be. It's about how God wants it to be. Prayer is not about giving advice to God. I don't think that God really needs our advice to you. It is about shaping us and how we view the world and how we understand that God is working in our lives. And so um, what is this prayer all about? Now, first of all, prayer is all about connecting with God. I don't know about you, but I delight when I get a call from one of my kids or even I think my dad likes it when I call and, and talk to him. We love connecting with each other. And right now it's mostly over the phone and God loves connecting with us too. He loves hearing from us in prayer. Um, but it's also a way of laying things before God, offering them up to God so we get them off of our chests and out of our brains. Um, it's a way of confession, and there's a whole bunch of other things that go with prayer, and it's also about petition. We are asking God for things, but when we are petitioning God, when we're asking God things, it's a lot less about convincing God um, of what God should do, and it's a lot more about training our own hearts about how God is at work in and through us, that it's not all about me. And so when we say, thy will be done, I think it expands into, thy will be done, God, because I am sorry for all the times I was only thinking about myself. I was only thinking about my will and not your will. And when we talk about the kingdom of God, that we talk about a lot in the Lord's Prayer, and we think about the kingdom coming, um, there's kind of two parts of that, two dimensions of that in the prayer. The first is the kingdom that is to come, that the kingdom that will come at the end of time as God kind of closes this world down and brings heaven down to earth. Um, we kind of all know that when we die, we go to a heavenly realm, a place um, that is not here, that where we don't have to worry about anything. There is no sickness, there's no hunger, there is no death. Um, there just aren't the tragedies that there are in this world, right? Um, and so the kingdom that is yet to come is when that heaven will come here on earth and that is what god's will is that it would be like that all the time um and but there is also the kingdom that is breaking in here on earth every time that we do things that make it more like heaven every time we feed hungry children every time we give our coats to our neighbor who might not have a coat. Every time we support our food pantry here in Alden and in Central Lake, that is the way of the kingdom in breaking into this world. We get a foretaste of what heaven will be like where nobody is hungry and nobody is hurting and nobody is sick. And so we pray that this future thing will someday come here on earth. Um, and so we believe that heaven breaks into earth when we do the things that God wants us to do. When we offer kindness to someone else, we bring a little glimpse of heaven here on earth. And when we are um, getting close to that. The more we do that, the more we see heaven here on earth. The more 
our world looks like the kingdom of God. And Jesus preached about the heaven, the kingdom of heaven is upon you, or that the kingdom of heaven is breaking in, and so you need to repent and change the way you think and change your heart, and then you can be a part of it. And when you bring this kind of kingdom living into the world, the world is going to change. And when the church is being the church, that is what heaven looks like. When we are doing the will of God, when we are doing the things that Jesus told us to do, um, it is a chance for a new beginning and a fresh start and a way for people to grow into being who God created them to be. The kingdom comes apart about every time we do the things that God wishes for us to do. It comes every time that we pray, thy kingdom come, and then we actually roll up our sleeves and do something about it. It's when we pray and when we pray this prayer and we say, thy will be done, thy kingdom come, we are inviting God to do something through us. <clears throat> Thy kingdom come, Lord. Use me in bringing about your kingdom. Help me to see the world as it should be. Use me to do something about it. And in doing that, God's will becomes known in the world. You know, the church is just an outpost of the kingdom of God. And when we gather together each week and then we go out into the world, we send you out into the world, we are sending each other out to make the kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And hopefully that day will bring everything that we are doing, that God is doing through us, to completion. And so these biblical scholars, they talk about the kingdom of heaven in two ways. They talk about the kingdom of God in the already and in the not yet. You know, when heaven actually comes down to earth. When we are working at these little glimpses of heaven by what we do, how God is using us in the world, and when that day will come, when heaven will come down to earth. And so we all already know what it is when we live out our faith in the world and when we live in kingdom ways. That is when the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And when we read the Old Testament, the prophets, they talked about a time that they looked forward to when the swords would be beaten into plowshares and the spears into pruning hooks and the wolf will lie down with the lamb, and all through creation there will be no more violence, there'll be no more war anymore. And that was their expectation of the kingdom that was to come, which after all the violence I've seen on the news this week, it sounds pretty good to me. And um, in the New Testament, we see Jesus's vision of the kingdom to come all through his ministry and his actions and his words. There's more than 500 verses in the New Testament where Jesus talks about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. He uses kind of those two different phrases. And um, then it is uh, it comes to fruition in the book of Revelation, which a lot of people kind of have a I don't know, there's, they just look at the whole book of Revelation different than the whole rest of the Bible. But I wanted to read to you, and of course my printed copy is not so good, so I am going to read it out of, it looks like I have a children's Bible here, um, but it is the same as the rest of the Bible. It's from Revelation 21, and it is verses 1 through 5. Um. Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, 
prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from her, their eyes. This is my favorite part. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? In the New Testament, there is this prayer that we read. It's Marantha is the word. And it means, come Lord, or come Lord Jesus. And it is this longing, like when the church was being persecuted uh, in the first centuries. And I can imagine in Hitler's Germany, those people who were being prosecuted yelling out, Marantha, please, Lord, come. Come and make this world, this broken world, not be so broken anymore. Transform it into your world that is yet to come. And so when we say the Lord's Prayer, when we read this line of the Lord's Prayer, we are praying for God to come down to earth, and we also pray for us to be instruments of bringing about the kingdom of God right now and right here in the ways that we are at work in the world, that we are interacting in our world. That we on a daily basis are going to do things that are going to bring just these little glimpses of God's kingdom, these glimpses of heaven here on earth. Thy will be done. And when I'm saying thy will be done, um, I'm not saying my will be done, right? Because that thy is in contrast to me and my. And this goes, you know, we, we, we were just at Revelation, the very end of the Bible, the second to last uh, chapter of the Bible in, in Revelation 21. And now we're going to go back to the very beginning of the Bible, to Adam and Eve. And the story of Adam and Eve is an archetypal story. It is a story that is really not so much about these two ancient people. It is a story that is about you and it is about me. And because in the garden, God says to Adam and Eve, he's like, this, there's this one tree that I don't want you to eat from. Um, I don't want you to eat from this tree, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because the fruit from that tree and eating from it, it's going to hurt you. So just don't eat from this tree, okay? And of course, what is the thing that Adam and Eve most desperately wanted to do when God said, don't eat from this tree? It got, they're just like us. When we're told not to do something, what's the first thing we want to do? That thing we're not supposed to do. I mean, I all my life thought it would be awesome to stay home and watch TV and um, not have to interact with the world for a year, right? But when we've been told to stay home and not go out and not gather with people, what's the first thing we want to do? We want to go out and do things. And so Adam and Eve, you know, the first thing when people tell us no, we want to do those things we know we aren't supposed to do. And so the story of Eden, the story of Adam and Eve is that we don't do the things we know we're supposed to do, and we do the things we know we're not supposed to do. And I mean, here's a great example, and I wish we were all together in worship, but you can you can raise your hand or you can say it where you are, because I bet you I know the answer before you say it. If And there, I'm sure there are some of you who are good, good people who this won't apply to, but you're the exception, trust me. If a speed limit sign says 55, how fast are you going to drive? Just yell it out where you are. 62. <laughs> 62. I'm going to out my husband. My husband says 62. I'm going to admit usually it's 60. Sometimes it's 65. So yeah, 62 is probably the average. 
But I am going to bet that most of us don't drive 55 when the speed limit sign says 555. And I'm gonna really bet even more that most of us don't drive five under or 10 under, at least not as many of us who drive five over or 10 over the speed limit, right? We do the things we know we're not supposed to do just because somebody told us not to do it, right? If we can get those extra five miles in, hey. And so just like Adam and Eve, we hear that whisper of the sermon's serpent saying, oh, come on, they don't really mean that. Oh, come on, God didn't really mean that when he says, don't eat the fruit of the forbidden tree. And yet, Adam and Eve, we know the story. They ate from that forbidden tree and paradise was lost. And our world has been broken ever since. This is the human condition, right? I don't like to be told no. You don't like to be told no. Um, and so that is what we do. We do the things that we know God doesn't want us to do. We want my will, not thy will, not God's will. So when bad things happen, um, we, and I know we have all heard this, when bad things happen, people like to say, it must have been the will of God, or that was God's will. And every time I hear that, and I have to stop myself from causing scenes in funeral homes, which I tend to frequent because of my job, I just want to yell out, no, because it gives me the fingers down the chalkboard feeling when something bad happens and people say it was the will of God, right? In part because you will never convince me that mothers and fathers burying their infants or young adults dying from drug overdoses or children dying in school shootings or entire um, communities being wiped out from hurricanes and tornadoes um, or any of those kinds of things, you will not convince me that that is God's will because I believe that God's will is for goodness and wholeness and right. And so you're not going to convince me of that. But more importantly, it doesn't really have to do with my opinion. See, I resorted to my will and not God's will. But more importantly, we wouldn't have to be praying in the Lord's prayer for God's will to be done if all the things that were happening in the world were God's will, would we? I think that what Jesus is telling us here is that all the brokenness in the world that we see is not God's will. It is not the world that God created it to be. It is not the world the way it was created before Adam and Eve ate that fruit of the forbidden tree. The world as God created it was perfection. That's what, that's what the Bible tells us. And if that was the way the world was meant to be, it would be heaven here already, right? Look around. Watch the news this week. Is it heaven here already? Is God's kingdom here on earth already? Well, it is for the three minutes at the end of the news story when they have that heartwarming story, right? Those are the God's kingdom stories. But for the most part, we know our world is not the kingdom of heaven yet. And so most people think, and I've heard some people say it, if it happens, God must have wanted it to happen. So it has to be the will of God. No, most of the stuff that's happening in the world, God doesn't want for it to happen. God's will is not for it to happen. And yet it happens anyway, because as humans, both individually and as groups of humans, we choose our will instead of God's will. God's will is not for people to get cancer and die. We are the ones who have thought we know better and not been good stewards of creation and have allowed chemicals into our environment that causes cell, human cells to divide and multiply in unhealthy ways causing cancer. It's humanity and the world's brokenness 
not God's will. And so that's why we have to pray every day and every week, not my will, but thy will be done, God. It's why we have to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So when you see something tragic, please don't say it was God's will. Your place is to act in such a way that makes God's will happen here on earth as it is in, in heaven. You are the one that is to take that brokenness in the world and bring about goodness and life and wholeness. We're the ones to feed the hungry, to give water to the thirsty, to find housing for the homeless, to share our cloak with someone who has none. <clears throat> now the last night of Jesus's life, after the Last Supper, Jesus takes his disciples out and they go out into the Garden of Gethsemane. And at this point, Jesus knew he was gonna be arrested and he was going to be tortured and he was going to die. And so he tells his disciples, we are gonna pray here and he, you know, he tells a few of them, you pray here, and then he goes a little bit in, and he tells some others, you pray here, and then he goes further in, and he falls on the ground, and he prays. He pleads with his father. He says, please take this cup from me. Don't let this happen. I don't want to go through what is coming. And yet in his mind, I'm sure Jesus knew that the Father was going to use his death for the redemption of the world. He knows that when he's going to be hanging on the cross, that just perhaps humanity will see some of its own brokenness and see God's love for them, and that in Jesus' death there would be redemption and reconciliation, and in his resurrection, that there would be hope. Now, I, am, I have to believe in his head he knew this, but in his heart, because remember, even though he was fully God, he was fully human. In his heart, he did not want to go through what was about to come because it was going to be pretty horrible. And so Jesus finished his prayer after he said, let this cup pass for me. He said, not my will but thy will be done. And the Bible, it calls Jesus the second Adam because Adam prayed through his actions, not thy will, but my will be done. I'm gonna do what I wanna do. I'm gonna eat from that tree that you told me not to eat from, God. But then Jesus comes along and Jesus prays, not my will be done, but thy will be done. And so Jesus is calling us here when he is teaching, this prayer, teaching us this prayer to do the same thing on earth as it is in heaven. And so William Willimon and Stanley Hauerwas, they said in their book on prayer, they say, unexpectedly, quite surprisingly, politics crept into our Christian prayer. And now I know with the last few years, some of you are now shutting down, your ears are closing, or you're getting ready to turn off that screen right now when you even hear the word politics. Am I right? But hear me out. Hear what this has to say, because this is about Jesus and not about politicians. Um, my bachelor's degree was in political science and economics in French. Humorously, I thought I wanted to be a diplomat. God said, well, I've got some diplomacy for you. Go be a pastor, right? And, but what I want you to understand is that all politics is, is deciding who gets what, when, and where, and how they get it, right? Simple enough. All politics is, is deciding the allocation of assets. Politics is all about how we choose to order our world, even though uh, politics in the United States has seemed pretty disordered, at least in my lifetime, right? But what is in the Lord's Prayer is not Jesus saying to us, pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done in my heart, God, or just thy kingdom come, thy will be done in my family life and in my home. God, 
Um, or even just, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in my church as it is in heaven. Jesus is teaching us to pray here, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, the whole kahuna, on earth as it is in heaven. Now, Jesus is not saying here that we need a theocracy where we impose religious ideas through government. That's not what he's saying. But what Jesus is saying is that we need to be working to make the earth look like heaven in every sphere of your life. So let's suppose you are a Christian who is also a politician, and it means that you are working, or you should be working, to make the world look like the kingdom of heaven. Now, if you're a politician, you're not going to use those words, right? People get very twitchy when people who are politicians bring out their own faith. Um, you are not, so you're not going to use those words, the kingdom of heaven. You can use your own faith, though, to live it. And I'm going to argue it's not that hard to say those things and do those things without using churchy words. I mean, Fred Rogers talked about the kingdom of heaven every day for decades on Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, and not once did he utter the word God or Jesus. All he talked about is how we love each other and how we take care of each other and how we take care of our world. And so how you do that is to say, I want the world to look like how it's supposed to look, right? That's what we mean when we say the kingdom of heaven, the, how the world is supposed to be. That I want to work for the common good. I want our town or our township or our county or our state or our country to be the best it can be. I want it to be a place where justice and love and kindness and mercy are the driving force behind everything. I want to be it to be a place where people don't go hungry or thirsty or sick or where they, they can't get better because they can't afford health care um, or that they can't do the things they need just to survive without somebody coming along and helping. And so we have different ways of approaching all those problems in our world, right? Democrats and Republicans or progressives and conservatives or however you want to define yourself, we all bring different solutions to those problems, how we're going to solve those problems. But I believe we all want the good, the right things, the good things. We want to take care of our elderly. We want to take care of our children. We want, um, we want our hungry to be fed. And so I think we all want the world to look like this, like the kingdom of God. We all want the common good. Now our friends in the Anglican church, they have a phrase, and of course it's Latin, because uh, they're a little more high church than we are. And the phrase is ora et labora. I don't know if you've heard that before or not, uh, to describe this balance. And so ora is Latin for prayer, and labora, which you probably can guess this one, it means work. And so what this phrase is saying is that we work and we pray and we pray and we work and we do all of this together, that those two things aren't separate, that our prayer life and our faith life and our work life and our just living life life, they're not separate things, they work together. Now, Ron Heifetz, who is not a theologian, he is actually a professor at Harvard, and I think he uh, teaches at the Kennedy School. It's, it's a leadership thing. He writes on leadership for uh, leaders in government and, and business and such. And he said, this is what people do. And uh, I'm going to say this is what people do when we pray the Lord's Prayer. But this is what he says leaders do, effective leaders do. And he says, like, I guess I'm gonna use my arms. This is the world as it is, and this is the world as it's supposed to be, right? And the world as it's supposed to be is what Jesus calls the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And the world as it is is what we see in our daily lives or on the evening news. And what Hyphen says should be the goal of a leader, and I'm going to see, say should be the goal of every Christian, is to close this gap and to make the world as it is 
more like the world ought to be. And for Jesus, the world as it is supposed to be is the kingdom of heaven. And like I said, he spends more than 500 verses telling us all about it. And so our challenge as Christians, as people of God, as people who follow Christ, is to close that gap. Now, I have not been there, but I have plans to go there. I want to go see all the Wesley Heritage sites in England and some of my ancestors come from England, so I'm going to go do genealogy and stuff. But what I have heard about England, one of the things I have heard about is the tube, which is their name for the subway system there. And on the subway, um, there is a platform that you stand on, and then there is the subway car. And in between it, there is a little gap. And if you were to accidentally get your foot in the gap, you could lose your foot or even, at worst, lose your life. And so people are always saying, and I guess there are voices that come on every time a train comes and goes that say, mind the gap, mind the gap, mind the gap. How are we as Christians minding the gap? I mean, picture in your mind the way the world is supposed to be. Picture the way how we should be caring for one another. Picture how we should be caring for all of creation. Picture how the church should be at work in the world, being the hands and feet of Christ. That is how we mind, mind the gap. That is how we bring those two things closer together. Now, we have had a contentious political season, and I think that is being kind and generous, right? It got pretty ugly there. And all of us, no matter what your background, I remember talking to people, we are all, I think, as Americans, pretty disgusted with all the negative ads from politicians. And there is a lot of money that's being spent uh, by dark money, money packs or even politicians towards each other, slandering their opponents, telling you how awful that other person is, right? They're not talking about the issues. They're just telling you how awful the other guy is or gal. Um, and so how, what would the world be like? What would our country be like if instead of having all that negative stuff, all that the way the world is, what if we had a political season where politicians just got 60 second ads, no matter Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, whatever their politics are, where they would just say, here's the way the world is. Here's the way I think the world ought to be, or we think the world ought to be. 60 seconds to say, here's the way I'm going to bring those two things closer together to mind the gap. Wouldn't that be amazing? I would love to hear how all the politicians think that we can make the world more the way it ought to be, more the way of the kingdom of God, even though they wouldn't use those words, I'll use those words. That would be a wonderful thing. But here's a better question. How are you minding the gap? What are you doing to bring about the kingdom of heaven? Once you start living your life that way, once you start looking for ways that you can close that gap, that you can make the world as it is closer than the world as it, closer to the world as it ought to be, it becomes a lot of fun. There is a lot of joy in helping people in doing those things. And I believe that the church should be at the heart of it. It's why we work together. It's why, it's why we give our offerings. I mean, we don't want to give our, well, I do like having heat and lights in the building. So we do, I mean, that is what some of it goes to. But really what we are to be doing with all that God has given us is to be using that in the world to make the kingdom of heaven here and now, to close that gap in the world. And we do that because we gather together and work together. We can do so much more together than we can do separately, right? 
And so here is what I am going to suggest. And I realize I am saying this in the middle of COVID. I came to these churches um, in the middle of COVID. Last year was not even a year that was normal. I mean, it seems like every sentence starts out with, well, this is what I want to do, or this is what usually happens, but COVID, everything's COVID. But I don't think we can live in that in-between time forever. I think we need to start as the churches looking forward, looking outward, looking to how we can close that gap in the world. And so I want to suggest that we start looking as churches at five-year and nine-year strategic plans. Now, why nine years and not ten? Because this is 2021 and a nine-year plan is going to get us to 20. 30. And so I want these churches to start to think about and pray. And when I say these churches, that's you. You are the church. We are the church together. Where we are needed in Antrim County, what are the ways in Antrim County that we as the church and we as individuals can bring the kingdom of heaven here on earth? We can be part of that inbreaking of the kingdom of God how we can move the needle, how we can close the gap, how we can dream about how God might use us, how God might already be using us, how God can use us in the ways we've been used by God better, and how God can use us in new ways that we hadn't even thought of 10 years ago or five years ago, or even last year before COVID hit. How might God use us? And um, I was thinking about the moon shot. I wasn't around for this speech, but I know a lot of you were. In 1961, when President Kennedy gave a speech at Rice University, and I'm going to share that video with you so you can see it too. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why, 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. But Kennedy talked about the moonshot. He was talking in 1961 about the United States doing something that nobody thought was possible, right? And by the end of that decade, which I was there for that, but I was a tiny baby, um, when we put Americans on the moon. I mean, how audacious for him to say, we're gonna put somebody on the moon, and a few short years later, Americans were on the moon. And so I'm gonna ask you to dream, dream big dreams and think about big things. Think audacious things, pray audacious things, ask God to show you those kinds of big dreams for our churches, things we can do. Because, you know, yeah, maybe next week we can't end hunger in Antrim County, but maybe we can do that by 2030 if we work together with partner churches and organizations. Um, back uh, well, not that long ago, when they started Nothing But Nets, uh, I'm going to guess you remember, at least some of you remember Nothing But Nets, and then it evolved into Imagine No Malaria. They said they wanted to end malaria in um, our world. And people thought that was crazy talk, crazy. How are you going to end malaria? They had in some countries, they said had half of the children died from malaria, from mosquitoes. How are you going to stop this? And you know how they stopped it? $10 at a time, $10 buying malaria nets. And the NBA and churches and organizations all worked together 
And we are at the point we have almost ended malaria worldwide. Things, big things can happen from small steps of trying to close that gap and building the kingdom here on earth. And so I am going to invite you this week, this month, even this year, because sometimes God, you know, God's not on our schedule. When I say, hurry up, God, and give me the words or give me the prayers, sometimes it doesn't happen on our time. But I want you to pray about this. I want you to take some time with a pen and paper or your keyboard and your computer, and I want you to write down the ways that you think these churches should be moving towards closing the gap, towards bringing the kingdom of heaven here on earth. How Alden United Methodist Church and Central Lake United Methodist Church, and I truly believe that some of those ways are going to be ways that Alden Church is going to close the gap and bring about the kingdom of God, and some of those are going to be ways that Central Lake Church is going to close the gap and bring about the kingdom of God. But I have seen you guys work together, and I think God might be calling us to do some things together to bring about the kingdom of God here in Antrim County. And so I invite you to put pen to paper, to pray about it, to pray long and hard about it, and to share those with our ad boards and to share those with me, I would love to get emails and letters or give me a piece of paper where you have prayed or talked to me about it even more. But I know people are cautious about talking face to face. Call me up and tell me how you feel that God is calling us to be God's people here in Antrim County. What is God calling us to do? How is God asking us to dream big dreams? And how is God calling us to close the gap? And so my hope and my prayer is that you mean it every time you pray the Lord's Prayer and you pray, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May we make Antrim County look a lot more like God's kingdom and heaven here and now. And so if you will pray together with me the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, the next one we're going to sing is O oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing.
God, as you have made disciples of us, now you send us into the world to make disciples of others. Go with us and be our guide, that the witness of our lives may confirm the testimony of our lips. And all God's people said, Amen. <laughs>